All right, day three, I'm definitely feeling a little better. Uh, today might be a little loud because I'm trying to do this when my kids are home. Uh, hopefully they can stay quiet for this half hour or so, so we'll see. So picking up where we left off yesterday, um, I am not quite sure what you guys did together yesterday. Uh, and I have not gotten a chance to look at your responses yet on Teams. I'll be doing that in the next couple of minutes here. But here is, okay, maybe here is, here is page five from yesterday where we did the compare and contrast of physical versus chemical weathering. So going down the physical side, so actually, so what I want to stop and say is if you don't have this information that I'm giving you right now, hopefully you have room where you can add it or change some of the things that you've already written on page five. <coughs> If you guys already did this together um, with a teacher, especially if you did this with Mr. D, if you did this together, you guys can go ahead and skip through this spot. But if not, here we go. So physical weathering is the breaking down of rocks into smaller pieces. Um, you might want to add in there that it does not change the chemical composition, but that's not important. I mean, it is important, but as you can see over in the chemical weathering side, chemical weathering is the breaking down of rocks into smaller pieces by changing their chemical composition. So right away you can see some similarities and some differences with physical and chemical weathering. The types, and I did ask you to include a quick description of each. Uh, for physical weathering, I have the breaking down of rocks, when, or the breaking of rocks when water freezes and expands. Root pry, roots grow into and grow into a rock and break it. Abrasion is when rocks become smaller, smoother, and rounder, and when rocks bump against each other. Exfoliation is the top layer of rocks come off. And um, the factors that affect physical weathering, that's gonna be the climate, which is important to know that that's the cold and moist climate and um, weaker, less resistance rocks will weather faster. Over on the chemical side, so we already did that chemical weathering is the breaking down of rocks into smaller pieces by changing their chemical composition. The three types this time are oxidation. All you need there for a description is rust, carbonation, which is acid rain, and hydration is when water weakens the rock. Um, the Factors that'll affect chemical weathering for climate, they're gonna be a warm and moist climate. And then rocks that contain calcite will weather faster. Um, then on to the back on page six, and I must not have taken a picture of page six. Let's see if I can do this this way. One second. All right, so uh, the similarities for these are both, um, many of you probably put they're both weathering, which please add to that, that weathering is the breaking down of rocks. Um, and they both make rocks smaller. For physical weathering, physical weathering does not change the chemical composition, only makes them smaller. Uh, whereas over here, changes the chemical composition for chemical. Um, I included a really important difference is that physical happens in cold and moist climates when chemical happens in warm and moist climates. Um, then I did just list the four different and the three different types. So that is a good start for that. Um, as for whether they are more similar or more alike, that is a matter of opinion. You just need to be able to justify your answer, meaning you need to be able to explain your reason why. Um, so for some people who put they are more similar, they're pro you probably said something they're more simu similar because they both make rocks smaller. They both break them down. Um, if you said they're more different, you could say because they're more different because one changes the composition, one does not. You could say they were more different because of the climate they happen in. Either of those are good. And then finally, for question two there on page six, it says, what type of generalization can you make about both physical and chemical weathering? Both physical and chemical weathering 
chain, uh, both physical and chemical weathering break down the rocks. End of story. That's how you can summarize both of them. Um, then you had homework last night. That homework was on pages three and four. We're going to go over that right now. All right. <clears throat> so we have, um, we have page three, question one. It says, in which type of climate would the rate of chemical weathering being the, be the greatest? And right off the top of this page, chemical weathering happens more in warm, moist climates. So that's answer three. So yeah, answer, oh, can't circle it. All right, so answer three. Uh, number two, in which climate does physical weathering by frost action most likely occur? So again, right off of this page, top of page three, physical weathering happens most in cold, moist climate. So they're reversed, but moist and cold is answer four. Uh, question three, which brings back some old stuff we learned. Chemical weathering will occur most rapidly when rocks are exposed to. Um, so what are some things that, back on page two, what did we need um, to make oxidation? So flip back and look, what do you need for there to be oxidation? You need oxygen. What do we need for there to be carbonation? You need what? Carbonation is acid rain. So again, we need water. And for hydration, water weakens the rocks. Again, you need water. So to best do the most chemical action, we need air and water. Now, none of these answers say air and water, but hopefully you remember what these words mean. Hydrosphere means water layer. Lithosphere is the rock layer, so that's not the right answer. Remember the mesosphere and thermosphere on page 14 of your reference table, those are layers of the atmosphere. So we do need to be exposed to air, so that could be it. So we'll keep that one in mind. Over here in answer three, hydrosphere and atmosphere. So hydrosphere being water, atmosphere, remember our head is in the atmosphere, so that's the air layer. So this just says water and air which is the right answer, answer three. Uh, so number four, the diagram below represents a geological cross-section. Which rock layer is the least resistant to weathering? So again, I told you yesterday, that's how the Regents is gonna phrase these questions. They could, could put it in words that make more sense to us, but they won't. They'll use this phrase, least resistant to weathering. So remember, if something is least resistant, it's resisting the least. So it's kind of just letting it happen. Which layer here has let the weathering happen? So it's let the breaking down happen. Um, and that's gonna be this layer that's worn down the most. So this layer is just let the weathering happen and it got worn down. So that's this dashed line layer, which is right here, layer or answer two. Number five. Why will a rock weather more rapidly if it's broken into particles? So we did this one yesterday and the day before. Hang on one second. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so it says well, um, broken. Why does it weather more rapidly when it's broken into particles? And that is because now we're gonna have more surface area exposed. So once you crunch that lollipop or the Jolly Rancher, it's going to dissolve faster than if you kept it whole. Same with rocks. They weather faster when they're broken into pieces because more surface is exposed. <coughs> All right, on to the next page, which remember with earth science, you owe it and anything in life really, you should be reading all the words. So at the top here, it says, base your answers to questions six through nine on the diagram below which represents the dominant type of weathering for various climate conditions. And now we're gonna look at this graph. And your first thought is probably, holy cow, that's a lot of stuff going on. That's super messy. I can't do it. I don't even wanna try. I get that, because that's kind of my initial reaction. That is an ugly graph. But when you look at it, we've just got an X axis, 
mean annual temperature in Celsius, so it starts at negative 25 degrees Celsius, goes to 30 degrees Celsius. Then on the y-axis, it, axis, it says measure or mean annual precipitation in millimeters. So we just have how much it rains or snows in millimeters on the y-axis. And then other than that, it works just like a normal graph. So it says here, which climate conditions would produce very slight weathering? So I search this reference or this chart and I see that very slight weathering is right here. So now I just got to match these up. So I go through and do process of elimination. Answer A, 25 degrees Celsius is here and 100 millimeters is there. So if I bring those two together, that puts me right here in the moderate chemical weathering. So that's not it. So I go on to the next one, 15 degrees Celsius, that's right here, and match that up with 25 milliliters. Bam, very slight weathering. Normally I would go through and do all the others just to double check. So five and 50, that puts me up here. Again, not very slight weathering. And then negative five and 50, that puts me up here. Again, not very slight weathering. So answer three, answer two was 15 and 25, which puts me right in the middle of very slight weathering. So even though the graph looks super messy, once you just relax, take your time, it wasn't that bad. <coughs> Question six says, why is there no frost action shown for locations with a mean annual temperature greater than 13. So here is um, mean annual temperature greater than 13. So that's somewhere in here. Anything over here, it doesn't say anything about frost, uh, what did it say, frost action or frost wedging. Why might that be? So you gotta think a little bit. What do you need for there to be frost action, which by the way, means the same thing as frost wedging that we did yesterday. What do you need for there to be frost wedging? You need it, you need frost, you need ice, you need it to freeze. And this might be the one thing you might not have known yet because this is a little, we're gonna talk about this in a couple chapters. Do you guys know what temperature water freezes at in Celsius? If you don't, it's in your reference table. It is on page 13, maybe, don't quote me on that. Um, and we will learn it in, that, um, in a couple chapters, but if you don't know it off the top of your head, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So if the average temperature is greater than 13, why do we not have any frost wedging? Um, answer one, because there is very little freezing takes place at these locations. So answer question number seven, the answer is one, why is there no frost action? Because very little freezing takes place at these locations. <coughs> Question eight says, there is no particular type of weathering or frost action given for the temperature and precipitation values at the location represented by the letter X. Why is this the case? Right here is letter X. What kind of label does, is there, there's no label here. But if I, again, read all the words, let's look at this right here. This label says approximate limit of possible temperature precipitation conditions on earth. That's pointing to this line. So that says this line marks off where there's that amount of temperature and that amount of precipitation. So basically up here, there is no place on earth that gets any of these temperature precipitation values. For example, right here at X, which is about negative five degrees Celsius, and maybe like 130 degree or 130 millimeters. There is nowhere on earth that gets that amount of that temperature which that, with that amount of rain. So that answer, so why do, is there nothing listed there? It's answer number four. These conditions probably do not occur on earth. And question nine, what type of weathering dominates when there is a mean annual temperature of negative five, so that's here, and a mean annual precipitation of 60. Now, 60 is not on here, um, but I know that here's 50, here's 75, so 60 is somewhere in here. So here's negative five and about 60. Now, what the heck? I know they picked this one on purpose because there's no label, but hopefully you noticed 
this arrow and that arrow is moderate frost action. And that's answer number one. So when you have negative five and 60, that'll give you moderate frost action. And like I said, they picked this one on purpose because they were hoping that you being a normal human and kind of on the lazy side, probably, you're going to see that there's no label there and you're going to do something weird. So make sure you read all the words, including arrows that are labeled moderate frost action. All right, so that was last night's homework. And that basically sums up weathering. So now we're going to move on to erosion. Uh, so give me a second to stop this one. We're gonna move on to here. All right, so we're gonna start with erosion now. Um, like I said on Tuesday, this year you need to know the difference between weathering and erosion. No longer can you kind of use them at the same time. They are two very different words and you need to know their differences. So we, as I have here on the screen, weathering breaks the rocks. What does erosion do? So first of all, so what is erosion? It is the movement of weathered material from one place to another. Go ahead and write that. Um, so where are we writing this? Sorry, we're on page seven. It's titled Erosion and Deposition. And we're right at the very top where it says erosion. So you're gonna write erosion is the movement of weathered material from one place to another. So you can now see <coughs> how weathering and erosion, they're best buds. You, weathering breaks, erosion moves those broken pieces. As soon as a rock gets broken, something's going to be moving it around. Uh, so you can see what they, once they're weathered, they're gonna get eroded almost immediately. Um, so what are some things that can move sediments? Pick them up and move them. Yes, humans can. We can take our backhoes and our bulldozers and move sediments. You can take your um, Tonka trucks and put some um, rocks in the back and some sand in the back and move it from one place to another. But let's take humans and animals out of the picture. What natural earth things can move sediments around? These are actually going to be called agents of erosion. So they're they're the things that are doing the erosion and there's five of them. Um, so they're moved by agents of erosion. And so that's actually the next bullet that I want you to write. It's labeled agents of erosion. And I just want you to list these five agents. So go ahead and you can write the five agents, which are wind, running water, waves, gravity, and glaciers. That goes right in the agents of erosion bullet. All right, so those are the five agents of erosion. <clears throat> and before we get into too much detail about erosion, I think we should make sure everybody's comfortable with the third amigo in this group, um, and that's deposition. So when we break a rock and then we move the pieces, eventually they're going to be dropped off somewhere else, and that's deposition. 
So deposition is the process by which sediments are released or settled from or are dropped off by an agent of erosion. So go ahead and put that in the deposition bullet right there on page seven. So for example, so if we have a broken piece of rock that then a river picks up and moves it, well, when that river can't carry it anymore, it drops it off, that's deposition. Or if a wind, if the wind is blowing around some sand, well, when the wind slows down, it's gonna drop off the sand. Or on a beach, when a beach is moving some sand, when the waves stop moving, it's gonna drop off the sand, so that's deposition. So weathering, erosion, and deposition are best buds. They go hand in hand. First a rock gets broken, then it gets moved, and then it gets dropped off somewhere else. You really can't have one without the other. But like I've said, I think 10 times already today, you need to know the difference between the three. I need to be able to call out erosion. You tell me movement. Deposition, dropping off. Weathering, breaking. You need to know the difference between all three. All right, um, so the whole purpose of that hand in the middle of the page there is because there's actually quite a little trick to remembering the five agents of erosion. So right there on the palm of that hand, I would like you to write five agents of erosion. So put that right in the palm of the hand and we're gonna make what's called a fist list. And it just happens so nicely that there are five agents of erosion and five fingers. Um, and then on top of it, um, you may have already noticed that three of the words um, start with a W. So those are the three that I want you to write um, the way you, however you personally make a three. So when I make a three, I hold my, uh, thumb and my pinky down. So these three middler fingers, they're going to be labeled wind, running water. And I know running water doesn't really start with a W, but work with me. And then waves. So wind, running water, and waves go on the three fingers in the middle. And then on the thumb and the pinky go the three, two Gs, gravity and glaciers. Now, if that helps you remember the five agents of erosion, that's great. If it doesn't, then this just looks silly, um, but you do need to commit to your memory the five agents of erosion. And before we move on to learning in depth about one of these agents of erosion, we are going to sum up something here at the bottom of page seven. It says blank is the driving force behind all agents of erosion. It makes the rivers flow, glaciers slide, sand fall from the wind. What makes all of those things possible? Why does water flow down a river? Why do glaciers slide down a mountain? And why would sand fall from the wind? Well, that is gravity. Gravity is the driving force of all erosion. Yes, it's its own agent of erosion, but it without gravity, we wouldn't have any. Um, so right there in that little like flag area, that blank there, I want you in big bold letters to write gravity. So gravity is the driving force behind all agents of erosion. All right, so we are gonna go on now and we are going to learn a little bit about glaciers. So if you could turn your pocket to page eight and nine, and here's where I think we're going to have a dilemma. If your page eight looks like mine, 
So I think from now on, we might have page number issues, but we're gonna work through it. So if you're number eight, sorry, I'm in my daughter's bedroom right now. So that's her hairbrush and her puzzles and her mess. Um, so I guess I should have thought this through. If your page eight looks like mine, where it just has gravity and wind, and your page nine has the glaciers, those are the page numbers I'm going to be using. I'm going to help you through this if we get messed up. And in fact, if somebody could message me um, if your paper looks different, that way I can just know like how what I'm dealing with here. But for now, we're going to be doing glaciers, which for me is on page nine. For some of you, it might be on page eight. All right, I need to go back to my PowerPoint. <coughs> Actually, before we go to the PowerPoint, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to show you a quick, well, it's not actually a quick video. We're going to watch a video about glacial erosion. So what do you need to know about glaciers is basically what glaciers will leave behind. What does the land look like when a glacier has gone through? So for what I'm going to do now is your, I want you to watch this six and a half minute video, and then we'll just take some notes of the important things at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and get this started. Hopefully um, be ready at the volume control. This is either going to be really quiet or really loud. I'm not sure how it's going to play out on my, in my classroom. So get ready to turn this down or up if you need to. All right, here we go. This should work. So I'm just going to make sure I hit one button before. All right, let's do this. So let's start with a question. How does this giant angular boulder end up jammed in among these pine trees in Yellowstone National Park? To find an answer, we need to learn about some of the characteristic landforms left behind as a result of glacial erosion and deposition. A glacier is a long lasting mass of slow moving ice and snow. See our classifying glaciers video for more about the different types of glaciers. Just like streams, moving ice can be an agent for erosion and deposition. And just like streams, glaciers erode material from near their source, transport rock and sediment down slope, and deposit much of that material where they end. In areas with present-day glaciers, erosion forms steep-walled, bowl-shaped depressions known as cirques at the head of valley glaciers. Adjacent glacial valleys are typically separated by sharp, knife-edged ridges known as arets. Glacial erosion can occur where ice is in contact with rocks. Who among us hasn't frozen a large rock into a block of ice to test how tightly the ice binds to the rock? When this happens in nature, it results in one type of glacial erosion known as plucking. Plucking happens when water invades cracks in the rock. As the water turns to ice, it binds onto the blocks of rock. The motion of the glacier plucks the blocks of rock out of the cliff face embedding them in the moving mass of ice and transporting them down slope. Rocks frozen into the base and sides of the glacier act like sandpaper, scraping against the surrounding valley walls and floor in a second process of glacial erosion known as abrasion. Abrasion leaves behind telltale striations in the bedrock that identify the direction of the motion of the ancient glaciers. Some striations like these grooves worn into this limestone bedrock can be very deep, indicating that they were formed below thick, powerful ice sheets. The combination of plucking and abrasion deepens and widens V-shaped stream valleys to produce a U-shaped profile characterized by a flat valley bottom and steep sides. Much like this example from Scotland. In this U-shaped valley from the Beartooth Mountains in Montana. If rising sea levels were to flood one of these things, we would have to call it a fjord. Up to now, we've been focusing on processes that cause erosion. Now we want to turn our attention to features formed when glaciers deposit material near their terminus. Most deposits left behind by glaciers are composed of a generally unsorted mixture of clay, silt, sand, and boulders known as glacial till. Ice at the terminus of a glacier will melt and dump piles of till. If the position of the terminus remains stationary for some time, it can leave behind a ridge of unsorted till known as moraine. 
Moraines essentially define where the glacier paused and the position of the moraine that is farthest down the valley, <coughs> the terminal moraine, indicates how far the glacier extended during its history. Ice sheets leave behind moraines that can be traced for hundreds of kilometers across multiple states. For example, this shaded relief map of Ohio shows the positions of several moraines stretching across the northwest corner of the state and into neighboring Indiana. Piles of unsorted glacial till can be trapped by an advancing glacier and shaped into oblong mounds known as drumlins that narrow in the direction of glacial motion. Behind the moraines, we also find hundreds of small lakes known as kettle lakes. Kettle lakes form when blocks of ice break off a retreating glacier and are subsequently buried. The ice gradually melts, forming a depression in the glacial sediment known as a kettle. These low areas may then be partially filled to form a lake just like these kettle lakes in North Dakota. A feature known as an esker may be formed when till is sorted by streams flowing at the base of the melting glacier. The sediment deposited within these subglacial streams leaves behind a skinny, sinuous landform. Likewise, as the glacier melts and its ice turns to water, meltwater streams transport sediment away, depositing some of it in the adjacent outwash plain. Thick ice sheets can pick up very large rocks, known as erratics, from one location and deposit them elsewhere, sometimes hundreds of kilometers from their source. By matching the geology of the erratic with their source area, we can unravel the direction and distance of motion of the ice that move these wandering boulders. And that brings us back to our 500-ton friend among the trees in Yellowstone National Park. This boulder of metamorphic gneiss sits on top of volcanic rocks hundreds of millions of years younger in age. And the boulder must have been carried at least 25 kilometers from its source. Okay. So while that video had a lot of information in it, we don't really need all of that. Um, so to sum it up, um, when talking about glacial erosion, um, we'll just... And again, it's nothing to write yet. It just says, how do glaciers erode? So glaciers erode, um, they're like large streams of slow moving ice. So basically they act like a giant bulldozer. Glaciers are able to move anything that's in their way. So um, just like a bulldozer would plow through the land and anything that's in its way, whether it was a tiny piece of sand or a giant boulder is gonna get pushed out of the way. And um, I believe the uh, video did not mention Finger Lakes. So we're gonna go into some details about Finger Lakes. But the video did say that glaciers create U-shaped valleys. And that happens when you already have a V-shaped valley that then the bulldozer plows through, the sheet of ice plows through and it makes it, rounds out those Vs into Us. So you can see here, this U-shaped valley, not a V, but a U. Um, and here's how that would happen. So we already have the V shape and you can clearly see the V that then gets filled with ice. And just like the ice in a crack for frost wedging, it works the same way that ice expands and um, makes that V shape change into this more of a U shape. So again, you can see V shape, U shape. So glaciers make U shaped valleys. Uh, again, we're gonna get into some more details about, um, so the, I'm sorry, the. We, we will talk about these finger lakes here in a second, but um, on here they're pointing out the moraines and the drumlins, which are basically piles of sediments that get dropped off by the glaciers. One thing to note is that the sediments are always going to be unsorted sediments, which means the glacier will pick up any size thing and drop anything off when it's melting. So it doesn't matter if it's a big sediment or a small sediment, glaciers take everything. Um, plucking, the video mentioned plucking, that the glaciers pluck off the rocks as they move and they carry them to other places. Here's a picture of this unsorted sediments. So you can see we've got sand, silt, and clay, so the teeny tiny dirt particles, giant boulders. We have this cell phone, this ancient Zach Morris cell phone here. Um, I think it's just there for size. The glacier did not drop that off. 
Um, but you guys have no idea how big that cell phone is, so that's not helping you at all. But we've got big rocks, tiny rocks, and sand there. So glaciers always drop off unsorted sediment. Again, the moraines, which are these piles that are right next to where the glacier was, those are unsorted sediments. <coughs> so the video again showed you um, pictures of these, these cirques, and I think they're pronounced Rx, I'm not sure, and a glacial horn. These are all caused by glaciers. Again, U-shaped valley. Uh, drumlins. Uh, this is important with a drumlin um, that you can actually tell which way the glacier was going based on the way the glacier or the drumlin is shaped. Um, so we will always, where the glacier first started, uh, melting and dropping off sediments, there's going to be the most, the biggest pile um, here in the front, and it's going to taper off like that. So you can always see um, this shape. It's going to have the blunt end and then this gradual slope down. And that's kind of like an arrow telling you which way the glacier moved. I like to relate it to this guy here with this funny shaped helmet. So again, we have the blunt side right here and then the gentle slope. So we can tell, um, just like on this picture, the blunt end is like where it started and it's going this way. So in this case, we got the blunt end and it's going this way. Uh, they did mention a kettle lake. So basically a chunk of ice sat on the land and then melted into these little um, round lakes, uh, just like we got going on here. So we've got a block of a glacier sitting on some sediment and it will slowly melt into this shape lake. Um, and then the very last one, I think it's the last one, a uh, couple, actually a couple more. So the erratics, um, like that boulder they showed in Yellowstone in the video. Um, these are just like weird rocks that don't belong where they are. Um, and they're called erratics. You may have heard of an erratic driver. That's like a crazy driver. So they don't belong on the road. Um, glaciers can also scratch. All those rocks in the bottom of the glaciers are going to scratch the ground underneath them. And those are called striations. And you can see these scratches. They also tell you which way the glacier was moving. So you can see all the scratches are in the same direction. All right, on page eight or nine in the glacier box, I would like you to write these, um, was there one, two, three, four, five, uh, bullets about glaciers. So you will have to write a little small to get them all in there, but I'm pretty sure you can do it. So go ahead in glaciers in the big ideas box, go ahead and write these five bullets. So this sums up everything we just talked about with glaciers.
<coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> Sorry again. All right. Um, I'm not exactly sure how much time. Hopefully you are not right at the end of the period, but this is where we're going to leave off for today. Uh, and you don't have any homework again tonight. Uh, hopefully you guys are doing good and I will see you next week. Actually, you got another video coming up uh, tomorrow, but besides that, then I'll see you next week. Sometime.